Okay, it looks like most people have joined, so we'll kick off. We've got another great webinar today, the Guide to Building a Resilient Business. We've obviously do a lot of different webinars and bits of content on our website on a regular basis, gen generally around obviously business risk index, um, credit collections, cash flow, that sort of thing. So it's nice to change it up a little bit. Obviously, we produced a really nice guide, which we've um, creatively called the guide to building a resilient business. And we're going to talk about that today. So let's get into it and have a look at the agenda. And then I will uh, introduce the speaker who is joining me, the guest that's joining me as well. So setting up for long-term success. Um, the guide itself looks at eight key pillars to, to strengthen your business. And I think it's always important to take into, into consideration context. Um, you know, credit or watch, we, we, we love, I love talking about and setting up for, for longer term success. I uh, love talking about strategy um, with, with my board and, and obviously with my um, senior leadership team. But it's always horses for courses. There's, you know, what, what we were doing, what we're doing now with 200, almost 200 people, very different to what we were doing 12 months ago, three years ago, 10 years ago, et cetera. So um, I'm not necessarily suggesting you've got to do everything, but what you can do is, um, is plan ahead for the future, which is always beneficial. If you've got questions, please use the questions um, section in the GoToWebinar control panel. Um, uh, questions and answers will always be dependent on, on how long um, we talk for, uh, but if we don't get back to you in the, uh, the webinar itself, I, um, I'll get back to you thereafter. All right, so who have I got joining me today? I've got Michael Finglan. Michael, great to have you along. Thanks for joining. Hi, Patrick. Morning. There you go. Excellent. Morning. Um, thanks again for, for joining us. We've I think there's a bit of bit of fun putting this together, both the guide but also the, the planning as well. And and I think um, the plan is for in typical credit or watch style, a more um, informal sort of discussion here um, where we can where we can dive into not only the, the content itself, but also of course um, provide some real world examples. Um, I'm keen to pick your brain on your favorite business and strategy books, which you of course are showing off there next to um, the many awards <laughs> that you have won over the years, which I love. I'm, I think post or through COVID, everyone became very, very conscious of, of what, they, um, what they have behind them. And I can say that you are definitely in my uh, top favorite background setup. So, so well done there. Thank you. Um, so Michael's, Michael's one of Australia's most experienced business turnaround professionals. He's got a huge amount of experience, not just from a, um, I guess, a corporate turnaround perspective, but transformation, strategy, planning, et cetera, both for, uh, for, for, for good quality businesses and, and businesses that, that need assistance as well. So we've got some fantastic content ahead for us to get into. Very quickly, who's Creditor Watch? We are a commercial credit reporting bureau in the, uh, in the old sense, but really we're a technology software business. We help you onboard your customers, assess them to make sure they're gonna pay their bills, keep an eye on them through the, through the, um, through the life cycle of, uh, of that customer relationship and also help you automate the collection. So anything we can do to automate, create efficiency in the credit um, and collection space, we will, uh, we will provide you with. So if you want more information on that, just let us know um, at the end, or you can jump onto the website, creditorwatch.com.au. We also collect a huge amount of data. So while we won't really talk too much about data today, it's always good to, to set the scene um, as to what we're seeing out there. Um, but before we do that, let's get a poll. I spoke about context, very important. I wanna know what size business do you own or operate? So let me get this up, launch the poll. And if you can let us know, are you a sole trader? Two to 10 employees, 11 to 50, 51 to 200, and then more than 200. Michael, while they're, um, while they're clicking um, their relevant number there, the one thing I've learned from running business, uh, running Creditor Watch, being involved in Creditor Watch for sort of 13, 14 years, is there's a very big difference between a S in SME and an M in mm. in, uh, in SME. Um, have you found the same thing? And any sort of thoughts around that? Yeah, definitely. I mean, the S is more probably micro. You know, um, a medium business these days. I mean, certainly what we define a medium business is sort of 10 mil to 200. In, in, yeah, that's the sort of sweet spot. 
anything below that is a you know micro or small business. And I mean, a lot of the things that we'll go through today are applicable. Uh, it's actually amazing how many large listed clients that we work with that don't have a lot of these sort yeah. of habits and systems and processes in place. And uh, so it's so it's uh, just about working out what what are the what are the most effective and easy to implement initiatives to get going with, and just as you start building that momentum, but yeah, you know, yeah, the, spot the, on. The you don't have to be a, getting bigger. Mm. Yeah, you don't have to be a sort of two hundred plus, you know, ASX listed no. organisation to have, have a lot of these in place, and and they sort of certainly serve you well. And I think um, you know, cadence and rhythm and muscle memory become really important. Um, all right, well, I'll close this one, right? Mm. Yeah, go on. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Go on. No, that's right. That's it's all about discipline, and the one big advantage that small or you know small to medium sized businesses have in common is they they still retain that nimbleness, so you can actually implement all of these things quickly because you don't have that huge bureaucracy to to try and uh, uh, you know work, work work around it as as you say. Yeah, very good point. All right, so I'll close the poll, but Michael, just for for your FYI, um, sole traders make up about six percent, sixteen percent, two to ten. 38% 11 to 50, 22% uh, 51 to 200, and 20% uh, 200 plus. So, so a, fa a fairly good balance there. If you, if you were to break mm. sort of 50 plus, you know, you're looking at um, 30, 40, 40%, 40 and then, you know, uh, obviously the, the balance there sitting under 50, and that, that's probably a nice sort of, you know, small versus, uh, versus medium mm. one there. All right, everyone, thank you. Good to know that helps us formulate our discussions going forward. So really quickly, I wanted to provide a bit of a, um, a lay of the land. I've got two, two business risk index, which we put together on a monthly basis um, slides. Um, and you might hear Michael talk about the VRI when I'm talking about the VRI. So Michael, do you wanna just provide a little bit of uh, background on what, what your VRI is? Sure, thanks, Patrick. Yeah, the, the Vantage Resilience Index, as we'll call it today, or VRI, is a list of 50 uh, systems, habits, and processes that all long-term, highly successful businesses have in common. And it's really a combination, or culmination, I should say, of, of a range of uh, books by Jim Collins, Van Harnish, and, and a bunch of other leading authors that have identified the traits over the last 100 years of, of businesses that got to 100 years, those that went through major disruptive events and came out the other side and beat the market 10 to one, you know, like COVID, like the GFC, um, those that really scale up and beat their competitors. So it's, it's, a, it's a checklist, if you like. We call it the ultimate sort of CEO checklist, really, um, because these are the 50 things that, that you just need to make sure you've implemented and, and you're maintaining. Uh, and if you do that, you then get serious uh, momentum as you go forward. Nice one, thank you. So very different to the BRI business risk index, which is obviously looking at sort of leading and lagging data points, uh, indicators, such as this one, average value of invoices continues to, to, to deteriorate and has done for a number of years now. What does this mean? It means, you know, there's less revenue coming through, particularly small and medium sized businesses, less profitable. Um, and, and certainly, you know, we're seeing that both from the ABS, there was an ABS release yesterday, talking about um, businesses, you know, running down their stock levels uh, to record lows. And, and obviously that has the knock-on effect in that they're not going to their, uh, their suppliers um, and buying more. And we're certainly seeing that in our data. And of course, it's external administration is a really important business stress metric. Um, we, are, we are up and above pre-COVID levels. We are likely to continue to climb. Um, we, we think, you know, they'll get to about 30%, possibly more above the historical um, uh, long run average, pre-COVID long run average. And then we expect it to sort of peak around the middle of the year. Um, some caveats in there being, you know, when we get a real certainty or unanimous sort of media, economist, financial institution um, consensus that, that rate cuts are definitely on hold. And then the second horizon will be when there is real confidence in the first rate cut actually taking place, which um, I can tell you I'm looking forward to myself. All right, so Guide to Building a Resilient Business, you can snap that now if you want to download it, or you can go to the website, creditorwatch.com.au and and, um, and look for the resources or, or um, 
blog pages to, to get access to that. And this is what we will be talking about. And I think we've you know given you a little bit of a, a, a taste, a flavor of what you can expect from the discussion today. <clears throat> the eight key pillars um, that we're talking about are actually developing a, a strategy. And, and I think importantly, what is a strategy? Your why, um, there's some, there's some great, um, great documents, great uh, YouTube videos, great uh, books out there. Um, around your why, but I won't steal uh, Michael's thunder. Habits for success, sales effectiveness, business intelligence, working capital management, leadership and culture. And of course, the last one, which is which is um, probably the least sexy, but often, you know, extremely <laughs> important, particularly for, for you know, slightly larger organisations, um, listed organisations or, or those operating, you know, with licences and whatnot. Governance and accountability um, is, is very important. Um, all right, Michael, I'm going to I'm going to throw to you here. I, I love I'm a big Jim Collins um, fan. Um, I'm currently <clears throat> listening to I wish I read more, but I do a lot of um, listening rather to um, good to great for, for a second mm. time. Um, I think we can nerd out on books later on, but talk us through um, the importance of, uh, of developing a strategy and, and, and what what that is. That's good, Patrick. Yeah, I think before jumping into this, I think it's not so much having a strategy, but it's having one that you can continually review on the way through. So in everything that we've been doing for 20 odd years, um, it's everything on a page. And, and the reason why we're big fans of having a one page strat plan, one page financial pack, one page cash flow, three ways, everything, is if it's on a page, that means you've distilled it and, and you've really nailed it. You know, if you produce a 30 page, 50 page strap plan, great, but odds are it's going to sit in a drawer and you might look at it once every 12 months or so. The key to a, your, your annual strategy is is to work with the team to distill it onto a page. And that's, that's there's a lot of discipline and rigor that's required, but it, 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 it's, it's a fail safe process to ensure that you really nailed what are the most critical, critical elements of, of the next 12 months that you really need to nail. And one of the, uh, Jim Collins, um, who's, you know, a range of his books are, are the backbone of, of this um, pack, if you like. He, one of the things, he still does some consulting to clients. And one thing he always does, and I've adopted this for a number of years now with our workshops with clients, he always gets the CEOs in the room or your management team to answer this one big question at the very beginning. And it's, it's a really powerful question to, to get everyone thinking big picture. And it's simply this, you know, if there were only three to five things that you must do this year, what would they be? That could be opportunities, risks, whatever they are. If there are only three to five things that you must absolutely nail, what are they? And it's a good way to start a, a strategy session and use that to, to formulate, if you like, a lot of the, the initiatives that would then populate those eight pillars that we're talking about. And once you do that, it's very, because a lot of management teams get into the weeds very quickly. And they might come up with a lot of great small initiatives, but nothing that's really going to change change the dial. So it's a really good, you know, big picture question to ask up front. As I said, it's all about getting it on a page. Um, what, and particularly in the, in the current climate, there are a lot of a lot of uh, things going on, a lot of dynamics that um, a lot of businesses are going to have to grapple with, whether they like it or not. And it's a very tumultuous time. And the a lot of the Jim Collins books, I mean. He, Hopefully, um, a lot of people have have, um, have read or listened to his books. If not, um, then I, I'm actually envious because you, don't, you don't learn a lot about business once you get into them. Uh, he's basically studied 30,000 listed companies over the course of his career. And he identified the traits of those that made it to 100 years, so that's built to last. Then those that went from good to great, the one you mentioned before, and they really took off. You know, they, were, they were pretty good businesses, but then really took off and beat the market 10 to 1. Then the one that's really pertinent really for today, I think, and for this year is um, great by choice. And again, it was one of those common traits of businesses that went through major disruptive events and came out the other side way stronger and took market share off their competitors and, and again, beat the stock market uh, index 10 to 1. So that was done on the back of the GFC. Uh, and what we went through with COVID is, is exactly the same. There'll be another book written on the back of COVID by him or by others, again, identifying those common traits. 
and when you when you string them all together, there's a lot of commonality. Vern Harnish, Rockefeller Habits, um, is 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 a very similar scaling book up. to the Jim Collins books. We, we build scaling we build up two point around it about around scaling yeah. up by Vern Harnish, yeah. and it's and it's been extremely valuable and really easy to follow. I think the, yeah. the important thing, if you've never read any of these books, they're really easy to follow. You don't have to introduce every single thing that's recommended in it. Pick a few things and it'll make a yeah. big difference in your business. And even just do one trait a quarter would be um, would be transformational if you haven't got it in place already. And so in terms of strategy, one thing, you know, to, to and you really want to do these things before you, you document your one page strategy for the next 12 months or three years. Is what he calls the hedgehog and it's it's about really staying focused on what you're best at and we see this a lot with businesses that we've had to turn around or help turn around and that is they had a really good core as they grew um, they sort of strayed from what they were really really great at, at for chasing chasing revenue um you know which which i get um, and they sort of stray from their formula and and if you don't have the right financial systems now all of a sudden you've doubled tripled you're now doing 50 or 80 100 million dollars and you no longer know where you're making money, where you're losing money, and it just becomes so much harder to, 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 to navigate the way through. And what he calls is, he calls it the hedgehog principle, which is basically an intersection of three key things. What are you really passionate about? Um, and, and, and that's critical. Those that have stood the test of time, the founders had a real passion about some key purpose or some big problem they were trying to solve. It wasn't just about making money. If it's just about making money, you, you could build a successful business, but it, it won't, it won't survive the tough times. It just won't because your staff won't um, really galvanise behind you. And that's the key to having a really powerful why. Simon Sinek made famous again um, through through his uh, uh, highest ranking TED talk of all time. And that really intersects with the hedgehog principle with Jim Collins is if you're really passionate about something, it then forms the backbone of your culture and you end up with a really sticky culture. People that will do, they'll walk over coals for you um, and they're not just there for the paycheck. And that's why it's so important because you know, everyone you know, can, can perform well in a, in a rising market, but it's it's when times get tough, that's when you really rely upon and test that culture that you've built in the business. And the, I've, I've seen no better way to, to galvanise that and, and, and develop that glue uh, than the hedgehog and, and Simon Sinek's Y process, which is, which is again, is about knowing and really communicating through all of your recruitment uh, material, uh, as well as your marketing material. Because you want to uh, attract uh, staff that are aligned with your why. It's much easier to sell products and services to a customer that is aligned with what your purpose is. It just makes your job easier. Um, and that's what it's all about. If you can make your job easier as a, as a, as a salesperson, as a recruiter, as a manager, then, then life is just much, much easier. So the hedgehog is, what are you really deeply passionate about? Um, what can you be the best at? You don't have to be the best at it right now, but what can you be the best at? Um, so it can be aspirational, but not delusional. Uh, this would be something that you, you generally can um, you know, um, you know, strive to be you know, a leader or in the top two or three in your industry. And then, and this is a really hard one for a lot of business owners is what's, if there was just one KPI that you're allowed to choose, what is it? What's that number one KPI that really drives your economic engine? And there's a famous case study uh, about Southwest Airlines and it's the best one I've come across. And what they came up with is profit per fuselage or profit per plane. And when you get it right, it forces you to um, optimize and change everything that is an influencer on that one key thing. So for them, it turned into, well, if, if, if the profit per plane is the number one KPI that drives the profitability of Southwest, how do we influence that? And what they decided, well, realize is we've got to keep those planes up in the air for longer. The more time they're spending in the air, the more profitable they are. So everything was then restructured around optimizing um, and, and limiting the amount of taxi time and, and, and grounded time. So they only have 737s. They only have one type of plane. Uh, what does that do? It simplifies all of their training. They're only trained on one, air, one airline. So you don't have a complicated um, tr you know, training program and, and staffing uh, program. Your supply chain, incredibly, incredibly slim. You don't end up with you know, redundant stock and, and all different types of engine sizes and parts. And uh, so it made their entire operation so much more efficient and that's why they could beat the market. Uh, and they've gone on from strength to strength for the last 20 or so years. So that's how powerful it can be. If you, if you, if you get that number one, it doesn't mean you don't track other KPIs, but it's, it's really working with the team and identifying what's the one most powerful KPI if you weren't allowed to track anything else. So those three things are what's called the hedgehog. And then 
um, you know, that just gives you real clarity. Michael, I might just jump jump in there really quickly because mm. I'm, I'm conscious mm. we'll have some we'll have some um, listeners who are who are part of you know really big large organisations who, mm. who mm. I don't want them to think oh well you know that's not up to me I don't sit on the you know the executive leadership team or anything like that but mm. what what we've also seen in in our work just day to day with our clients is that um, the, the leaders of those of, of individual teams like a, a, a credit team a collections team you can still take these concepts and introduce them into your own into your own work you know what 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 are those sort yeah. of leading in what are, what are you really good at what's your team really passionate about it doesn't have to be the business it can yep. just be your individual yep. team um, that the concept yep, still really works and and for those going what the hell is a, a hedgehog just go and google hedgehog uh, concept you'll, you'll you'll see plenty of information but also google a, a hedgehog defending itself Basically, it's not fast. Um, it's not, you know, it's not got a lot of stamina. But when it rolls itself up into a ball, it's just a ball of spikes, so it can defend itself unbelievably well. And that—that's what it's the best in the world at. That's right. It, it it does one thing extremely well, and that's that's the whole. You know, and that, that's one of the hardest things in business is staying focused on what you're really good at, and using that as a lens when you when you're looking at acquisitions or you're looking to expand geographically. Is this going to strengthen our core business? Is it is it core? Can we be the best at this? It's such a really simple um, lens to use uh, when you're looking at uh, growth. All right, I'm conscious. I'm conscious of time because we're sort of one and a half pillars in. Um, do you want to just touch on your why? You've, you've sort of introduced it already. You know, the, I think the really important yeah. thing to do is um, is is have people follow you, walk over coals for you, understand mm. what is it that we're doing beyond just trying to, yeah. you know pay salaries and, and and make money for shareholders. Yeah, and, and it, it does intersect with that one part of the, the flywheel is, is uh, sorry, of the hedgehog, which is you know, what are we most passionate about? Yeah. And the a really good example, uh, so I highly recommend everyone watch uh, Simon Sinek's TED talk, uh, Find Your Why, uh, really, really powerful. And he goes through a number of case studies showcasing why it's important. Another book um, uh, in, in business, um, uh, Bob Chapman, a uh, book called Everybody Matters. It is a case study of his own, his own company. Um, he, he's now a global speaker um, and he talks to the power of your why and how it can really help you in, in troubled times. So when the GFC hit, um, they were a hundred year old business uh, making uh, uh, machinery and products for the, for the brewing industry. In the states, and overnight their their revenue declined thirty percent. So they were faced with the typical decision of, of most teams: do we lay off our staff? What do we do? And he'd already built this amazing culture, and it, it was just like all in water to him to to let a third of his staff go. So we challenged his team: come back in a week and tell me what other options have we got. Anyway, because they had a really powerful why and a, and a really strong culture, off the back of that. The staff all came up with with a um, a fellow program where it was voluntary. Basically, the, the call went out. We have to save twenty million dollars overnight. Um, how do we how best we do it? But maintain the culture. And the staff actually came up with the leadership team came up with um, a fellow program where um, some people could afford to take some time off. So it was paid leave. Or, uh, sorry, unpaid leave. They didn't do any redundancies. Enough staff said, you know what? I've I've got enough tucked away. I can take three months off or six months off unpaid leave, um, and that saved the business a heap. And then what they found is people were trading with each other because they weren't quite there. Some people couldn't afford to uh, take any time off without without pay, so other people traded and said, "Well, I'll take longer off so you can keep working full time." That's the that's the power of the culture they had. So that saved them uh, through through the GFC when a lot of their competitors and other manufacturers went bust. So. You come up, and as I talked before about that stickiness and, and people that will walk on coals, um, that's that's the power of your why harnessed. Um, and it's really about what, what are you passionate about, but making sure it's integrated into all of your marketing collateral in your um, elevator pitches, your, your um, you know, and, and particularly in your recruitment collateral, in your ads when you're onboarding people. Um, you've got to have it spread across. When you do that, it just, it just starts to create a life of its own and makes your job as managers much, much easier. But again, these are all workshop sort of process um, things to really tease out what they are. All right, so so pillar three looks at habits for success, and I sort of mentioned this before. Mm -hmm. You know, 
regardless of whether you're you know a small team or a large team, but particularly as you get bigger, it's very it's very hard to um, ensure that everyone understands you know what you're doing and and why from from a company perspective. But then you have these you know intercompany uh, sorry interdepartment um, projects that need to, to that need to be delivered. Um, you have you know management teams who who might be dispersed across multiple offices, states, even countries. Um, so mm. so from Credit Watch perspective. Um, this this is hugely important, you know, and, and we talk about operational cadence when we talk about, you know, um, mm. internally rather than habits for success. But you know, you, you have those those set those sort of set meetings, set communication um, channels, and and set way of, of, of communicating on a on a regular basis. And and you still find that you, you can never communicate enough. You can never communicate um, too much. It's it's just it's it's impossible. So even when you think you've mm. you've nailed it. You get feedback in you know we run a, a survey to, to staff on a monthly or bi-monthly basis and you still hear you know mm. we want to learn more we want to hear more so um yeah mm. keen, keen to get your, your input on, the, on this one of course michael well you're right it, it comes up in every staff survey uh want more communication ironically uh, the daily and weekly huddles are probably the of the top three of the 50 things there's 12 that do you know in the in the, in the resilience index 12 do 80% of the heavy lifting and daily and weekly huddles is in the top three. Uh, and it's so simple and easy to put in place. It, it gives that cadence, as you mentioned, and that regular yeah. communication to the team. And, and all this is simply this, and it's in Vern Harnish's Rockefeller Habits or Scaling Up, is do you meet weekly with the team at the beginning of the week to talk about big projects we've got on this week? Um, you're talking about resourcing, um, any any significant events that are on, etc. So it just gives everyone an opportunity to to understand what's going on around the firm or around your team. And then the daily huddle is is very short and sharp, 15 minutes tops. It's not meant to be a laborious toolbox meeting. It's what what what's my one or two big things I'm going to nail today. So it gives that positive sort of affirmation. What well, is one or two big things? Uh, am I stuck? Um, you know, do I have any or you know, as in can anyone, can anyone help me because I'm, I'm a bit under resourced um, and, and we'll do, do I have any capacity that I can then help? So what you start seeing is this rhythm gets going is people start speaking up at the beginning of the day. I can help you there. I've got an extra couple of hours and, and that starts that two way communication. So it's just a great way to um, kick off the day, kick off the week. Very simple, but really powerful and effective. The other one, which is a bit similar to that is what Vern Honus calls the quarterly rock process. And it's about coming up with what you know. What's the one one initiative that'll have the biggest impact for the business in the next quarter? So you could draw from your strap plan, or it could be something that's just popped up in the in your industry, or an opportunity that's come up. But what's that one thing that could have the biggest impact? Again, it's like that number one KPI. Get everyone to really drill down on the most important thing, and then you get your entire organisation around that, and then you come up with three to five initiatives that would implement that one big thing. And then ideally you have a reward at the end of that quarter. So everyone's talking about it at your daily and weekly huddles. You're checking in weekly how we're going towards that one big goal. And it just creates that rhythm and it creates that continuous 100-day. You hear a lot about 100-day plans. It's really a 100-day plan. Um, and, and it's again, every quarter you come up with that. What's that number one big thing? What's that number one big thing? And you start building significant momentum off the back of that. Um, so that's what he calls the quarterly rock process. Um, again, really powerful. We do this with every client. Uh, the other two that when you look at the, 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 all these habits, so daily, weekly huddles, quarterly rock process, the hedgehog process, your why, is, is what Jim Collins calls your flywheel and your smacks. Um, think of the smacks as the DNA of your business, the six to 10 things that um, have had the biggest influence on the success of the business to date. And again, it's just about distilling them down. They're already in the business, but it's about pulling them out and making sure everybody in, in the entire organization knows those six to 10 things that we know we must know we do. And, and when we do, we can't help but be successful. And then every quarter, every year, you then work on initiatives that are going to strengthen those six to 10 key smacks, which are, as I said, you're, you're, you're the DNA of the business. So for us, one of them is, is or when we're in turnaround, it's it's always working on site with clients because you've got to build their trust really quickly. Uh, the quicker a client can build trust with you, the quicker they'll 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 follow those those or the advice around changing some big fundamental things in the business. The quicker the turnaround. So we worked that out years ago. What are the ten things that we know that we must stick to? Uh, and again, it's all about discipline. Jim Collins is big on discipline. Discipline people, discipline thought, discipline action. 
So your SMACs, again, through a workshop process, you identify those six to 10 things that have made you successful to date. Um, the flywheel is slightly different. It's, it's the three to five things that if you focus on those, you can't help but build momentum in the business. So for us, it's you know, um, you know, invest in people passionate about turnaround. If we, if we do that, then, then you're more likely to um, then uh, continue to follow those, the proven um, smacks that we've got that, that have given us such a high success rate in turnaround. If you do that, you can't help but have a really high success rate in turnaround that then builds your brand, that then makes you more profitable so you can then reinvest in people again either recruitment or, or training and development, et cetera. So again, it's, it's, it's the smacks and the, and, the, and the flywheel, two of the most influential um, processes you can go through to really understand uh, what really makes your business um, so, so important. And, and very few businesses really understand it. They, they had a core formula and as they get bigger, they kind of lose their way a bit. They lose that. Same with the why. The why is always there. But often a lot of businesses, they lose that because the founder is no longer involved in recruitment and and the like so you end up hiring people that potentially aren't as passionate as you were at the beginning so these are all just tools that that really help you draw out the essence and, and the power of the business and in a, in a in a way that you can then replicate uh, into your onboarding process you can use it every quarter every year to really tighten up and and review and i think i think importantly this is you know a lot of these things most organizations are, are doing them in, in bits and pieces and and you spoke about you know having something documented like you, you know you, mm. you could ask senior your senior team or senior managers you know what, what's the strategy and they, they probably you know explain it in different in different terms but you know be on hopefully mm. on, the, on the same page but it, it's just not written down yeah um and you'll you'll have you know regular catch-ups but they're not you know they're not quite mm. as regular or you're not discussing the same things on a on, on, yeah. the, on the same basis and, and, and ensuring yeah. that you have those, those key notes so so it's not this isn't revolutionary it's it's very much you know evolution from you know what what business processes and um you know cadence you, you have in have in, in in place and i think that leads quite nicely yeah. to, to to pillar four and the, the first the mm. first point there i really like you know sales team must must know brand promise and um when when creditor watch was probably about uh, three years old we, we we raised we raised some capital um and the, the fund manager um so to speak came on onto our board and and he asked me about you know our, our sales um sales pitch and, and brand promise and he said mm. you know got that locked down like yeah of course you know brash um you know 20 something year old yeah we all know it it's like so everyone in all, all your sales team know 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 what it is and, and how to do it and how to pitch mm. and they're all pitching the same way so it's you know really you know you're refining mm. your pitch every time yeah he's like okay give it to me and I was like, uh, 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 stumbled over it. And then he asked someone else, you know, separately and they did it a different way. And it was a, it was a good wake up call because it, it forced us all to, to get on, um, to get on brand and, 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 um, you know, cycle at the, at the, at the same time, same speed. And, and, it, and it had a huge influence on the, uh, on, on the business. So, um, yeah, for, for me, sales effectiveness, but in, importantly, getting everyone aligned, which you can have this, not just in sales, but, but across the company is, is so, yeah. so important. Yeah, and the, these are all just tools that help you build momentum. You're getting real clarity on the, the secret parts of the business that, that have given you success. And then the discipline is to keep working on those, keep turning that wheel, keep, keep focused on those core things. Uh, whether it's your brand promise, you know what sets you apart. What's what are the three things that you absolutely promise you'll do? Up to three things. It might just be one, but and is that something unique? Um, Guy Kawasaki, one of the suggest um, our listeners look up is is the unique value matrix. Great TED talk on it. Again, it's about every now and then working out are we are we producing a product or service of value, and is it unique, and where is it on that scale? Um, and continually striving to push your product and services into that top right quadrant where you've got that sweet spot um, but but you're right Patrick the a lot of management teams might know it you, you, your brand promise your elevator pitch um, what sets you apart but if your entire organization doesn't know it, that's where you fall away and that's why in, in the resilience index the questions are which is the is the, the, the CEO checklist is not only do you know it but could your staff recite it you got to mm. all these questions as a leader you've got to be thinking could my I, I know it but could my staff actually say it so when they're in a barbecue, they're not in a work environment. Could they just naturally say it? Um, so that's 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 when you really start to get that momentum. 
net promoter score, everyone's heard of that by now. So critical, staff NPS and, and a customer NPS. Great feedback, um, tells you where you are at from negative 100 to positive 100 and gives you some good feedback. And then you use that as a, as a KPI. And then next time you do it, you wanna keep pushing, pushing, pushing and using that as a, as a real time uh, feedback loop. Uh, some clients also use it in their subcontractor base. You know, if, if they are a business that relies on subcontractors, really powerful tool to use there. And that's why we call it sales effectiveness. It's not just the sales team. It's everything from producing your product or service, shipping it, getting out the door, getting the money back in. So when we talk about sales effectiveness, we're talking about that entire process, which essentially replicates um, your working capital cycle, something that I know Creditor Watch is very, um, yeah. uh, very uh, focused on in, in all of your stats, because that, that tells you how much cash you got tied up. If your working capital cycle blows out from 60 days to 105, that's cash you don't have in the business. So when we talk about sales effectiveness, it's it's making sure that the, the, the logistics, procurement, manufacturing is is all joined up, and people have the ability to to pull the pull the flag. So if they're seeing something on on the on the shop floor, a quality issue, they need to be empowered to pull the flag. Then, otherwise, it goes all the way through to sales. Then becomes a sales return, or you end up with issues down the track. So in, when we talk about sales, always think about sales the entire process. Um, and if you do that as a leader, you, you're, you're less likely to have silos built up in your business as well, which is one of the big, big um, um, anchors to any business as you start to grow. You end up with these silos. Finance don't talk to sales, don't talk to procurement. So if you think of, of that, you actually sort of train your entire management team to be thinking about. Yeah, that, that alignment is, is is really powerful. Everyone everyone in it together. There's only you know there's one there's yeah. one company. Everyone should be should be working towards those uh, mm. those common goals. All right, business intelligence. I, I mm. you know, in the world of, you know, um, big big data, uh, business intelligence, mm. AI, et cetera, obviously, you know, data internal and external is, is, is becoming uh, spoken about um, often. Um, mm. And, you know, a lot, of, a lot of companies don't necessarily know what to do with it. I think, you know, we've, we've spent a lot of time mm. ourselves Obviously, we've got a huge amount of data that we're putting into credit reports, credit ratings. We do that very well, but then you know we've got additional you know internal data that we use for mm. finance, sales, prospecting, forecasting, budgeting, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, it's it's one thing to be able to to access it all in a in a um, easy to access sort of um, method, but then what do you do with it? What are the insights and reports mm. that that you pull out of it? So that my my piece of advice here and, and again I like the, the one page management pack got to keep it really simple mm. you got to understand like what you're trying to achieve and why not just hey we can yep. produce 100 reports with all of the data and you uh, and you end up you know wasting a lot of time effort and resources you know putting that all together for mm. what could be very little return and the ultimate test is could a non-financial person understand the business on a page um, that's that's the lens to look through and, and you know it's, it's amazing how many directors on that sit on boards don't understand financials um, so not, not to the level that you think they should uh, be yeah. in that position so can can anyone in the senior management team or, or board understand all your KPIs how we're tracking on a page it also makes it much easier when you're looking to raise capital um, if you can show your finances all these tools on a page they get to understand your business much faster. And that's what it's all about. When you're trying to raise finance, how do you stand out from the other 100 applicants that have got their applications in and you're going to rise to the top of the pile? So all these things are designed not only just to make it easier for you to run your business and be a lot more profitable and sustainable, but it makes you more investable more and, and more attractive to financiers because they can see you've spent the time, you really understand those number one KPIs, the things that really drive traction, you've got a great culture, and then on the business intelligence and working capital piece, you've got one page management packs, one page dashboards, a financial dashboard, an operational dashboard, 30 minute cash flow, three way forecast. These are all tools that give confidence. It, it, it helps you understand your entire working capital cycle and where you can tweak it to free up cash, but it demonstrates to third parties that you're on the ball. And you, 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 know, you know, pillars one to four are really about how you build momentum, how you got clarity around how you drive this business, and, and you know the key things that if you keep working on, it can't help but have success. You know, five and six are all about um, monitoring financially on the way on the way there and knowing which leaders to, to pull. Um, you know, one of the top five 
KPIs that we must track. And you, know, you have that one big one, but what are the other sort of four or five that really you know, do 80% of the heavy lifting? And that's what this is all about. Again, discipline. Focus on those things that really matter. Which are the levers that that will, will that if you pull will, will have the biggest impact? And really, these are just tools. They're not hard, as you said before. It's just the discipline to implement them and continue to maintain them. That's when businesses really take off is that discipline. We hear about it in the, in, in the health and physical education space, the discipline to go to the gym all the time and, and you know, eat well. And that's what it's all about. It's, it's doing the little things consistently. And that's, that's what happens. You won't know when the business took off, but a lot of significant business leaders talk about a decade when the business really took off, not, not one event. And that's what this does. It's all about building a wave and building momentum. And all these tools just help you build that momentum and make you much stronger. So when the inevitable shocks do come, and we are going to have a bumpy 12, 80 months, there's no question about it, globally, uh, domestically. So these are all about giving you that buffer. So when some shocks happen, you will fare much better than your competitors. And then you can use that process to take market share uh, off them on the way through. And another really critical one that we recommend is what's called a, a business stress test. Since the GFC, all major banks have to go through a stress test every year or so. There's no better time for a business to do that right now. And it's really simple. You just come up with the three things that if the economy takes a bit of a nosedive or your industry does, what are the three things that are probably going to happen? Sales might drop off 20%. Data days might push out 15. Um, whatever, you know, might have supply chain disruptions like we had through COVID. You model that. That tells you what your P&L and cash flow would look like. Right. What's the plan that we would implement if these three things happen? So, and then it sort of sits in your top drawer, if you like. So, when when the inevitable, the inevitable does happen, you you're into execution mode straight away. You're not fumbling around for three to six months, bringing consultants trying to work out what to do. If you've done it, you're already into execution mode and you're taking market share. Um, and that's that's so using these tools to to work out the plan in advance, if you like, as to what would you do. But I'll tell you, once you do it, you'll actually start realizing there's issues in the business we can fix right now. And that's the power of all these tools that you can do with your accountants or whoever. Just have the discipline to implement these and maintain them. That, that's the key. That's it. And I think, you know, that, that leads nicely, obviously, into to work, work and capital management. We've sort of t touched on a, a little bit there around, um, you know, the fundamentals of, of, your, uh, of your financial position, you know, what's, what, what levers you've got to to drive, um, you know, better cash flow. Um, obviously, the, the big chunk of our of our listeners um, or attendees today, obviously, working in, in in credit collections industries would 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 and should hopefully have a fairly good understanding of this. But the one thing um, we've we've introduced probably in the you know the last sort of twelve to eighteen months, we've we've always been very upfront and transparent with our um, you know sort of growth and and, and revenue, but but talking about um, you know, having the CFO talk about, you know, certain financial metrics to the whole business has been really powerful. It's, it's, it's empowering, empowering. Um, but also it, it helps those not in, not in finance, for example, understand why it's important, you know, why we introduce certain measures, why we have certain targets, how the, how the business fundamentally works from a, from a financial perspective is, has, has been, um, a really powerful sort of, uh, introduction for, for ourselves. Well, it tells you where the levers are. I mean, and the reason why it's always a 12 or 13 week process is that's a 90 day cycle typically. And that's typically the time it takes for most businesses to source, source of raw materials, manufacture it, sell it and collect the cash. So that, that's why we always talk and everyone else talks about these 100 day, 100 day plans, 100 day cash flows, 30 week cash flows. It's so you have a full understanding of your entire working capital cycle. And that, and that t gives you so much intelligence. Uh, you could be running a business for 20 years, see a 30 week cash flow, you'll understand your business even more. Because it shows you where all the cash is tied up and what, what are those levers you can pull uh, in times of need or, or just to release working capital from within the business now rather than having to go and you know, raise more finance from your financier. Yeah, and, and a shameless plug, obviously, Credit Watch can, uh, can form a big part of that, uh, that strategy <laughs> as well to, uh, to ensure that you're working with the right clients and uh, avoiding the wrong ones getting paid on time. All right, let's move to pillar seven leadership um and and culture um i think mm. at credit watch culture is something that i talk about often and all the time it's 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 i think one of our our, our secret source if you will um people are a hugely important a huge priority for us um we've got a value that um 
that is our people make the difference and, and they truly do. Mm. I think they, they buy into what we're doing, but we also recruit really good good people as well who, who, who can obviously mm. then do their job very well. Um, but but this mm. it, it can be one of those things that you get eye rolls from, look, I'm sure my, my staff roll their eyes from time to time <laughs> when I talk about culture and principles and values and, and beliefs, yeah. but um, you, you can't just sort of, you know, put it on a, Put it on a slide talk about it once and then never revisit it it's got to be the sort of thing that you're, yeah. you're regularly you're regularly talking about regularly trying to to make um you know iterations to to to, to improve it. it it is really really important of course you can also have that um, yeah. employee yes introduced as well yeah i think and you know, we've talked about it before all these things sort of blend in together it starts with that that powerful why purpose as i said at the beginning Hopefully, if you've recruited people that are aligned with that, if not, you know, re reinvest in that process now and make sure you're really looking for people that are aligned and you're asking questions in, in the interview process. Do they share the similar values that are aligned with your with your why? Um, the staff MPS process, you know, so powerful, uh, giving them a voice. The, the top five things, whenever you do these sort of employee leadership culture surveys, there's always four or five things that are always there. Um, Am I, do, do I have psychological safety is what Google found. And, and really what that means is, can I, can I contribute in a team environment without the fear of someone shouting me down? As simple as that. That was 60% of the score for high performance teams is, is what they called an organization has psychological safety. Um, are people empowered and, and people respect each other? That's, that's essentially what it is. Um, am I doing meaningful work? Uh, and, and am I creating change? It's all aligned with your why. So if you if you have that and you create that environment where people respect each other's opinions, you can't help but succeed. You, you've got you've just got so much thing so much going for you. Um, very very often, and you know this as well, pay is normally four or five down the list. It's they want to work for a company that's trying to do something different and, and create meaningful change. They want to have clear job descriptions. That's another one that always comes up in surveys. Have I got a clear job description? Do I know if I've had a good a good week or a bad week? Staff want instant feedback, just like we as leaders want to have feedback on the business every week or month. Staff want that regular feedback on how they're going. And if they don't, well, they're probably not right for your business. They're probably just coasting or well, they're there for the paycheck. So all these, again, the tools, it's just the discipline to maintain them, uh, regular check-ins with, with your, your staff force, your st workforce. That can be very casual, a coffee, just a random, it's, it's quite a powerful tool, Just just randomly, grab a staff member and say, let's go and have a coffee. Um, you know, it doesn't have to be uh, a structured formal sit down. And the more informal ones you do, um, you'll, you'll see a significant improvement in productivity. And back on AI, you mentioned before, Patrick, AI can be very confusing to a lot of people, artificial intelligence and how it's sweeping the world. When you boil it all down, all AI is, is a productivity supercharger. It's just going to greatly enhance, particularly in, in in um, in business, it's just going to supercharge the productivity of your workforce. Look look at it through that lens and start thinking about where where is the most labour intensive time in our entire process. That's where AI can benefit you, and you can use that to actually bolster the the, the culture in the business. Because it's not about replacing people; it's about outsourcing the real um, mundane parts of the workforce or the tasks. So those people can spend more time on strategy, more time on sales, more time on improving systems and processes. So it's not about just taking people out of the business. It's about getting everyone working on more higher value uh, tasks in the day. That, that's certainly the approach we're taking to AI. Where, where are all the, the low hanging um, or time intensive tasks that are really are not adding a lot of value? Start thinking about that. Um, that Cause that in terms of, growing your business over the next one, two, three years, you've got to embrace AI, but think of it through a productivity lens. Yeah, that's very, very good point. Very good point there. All right, the final pillar, governance and accountability. I, I spoke about it not necessarily being um, overly <laughs> sexy. It's easy to, to, to skip past, it's easy to um, ignore, but um, it, it's mm. unbelievably important. And it's it's very broad as well, right? It, there's, there's, there's a whole bunch of things depending yeah. on the size of your organization. Um, it doesn't need to be um, the sort of thing that you're getting stuck in the mud about and you're, you're worried about mm. you know, risk and compliance and, and, and stuff like that. You don't, you, it really is horses for courses when you, we're talking about governance and accountability for, for businesses of all sizes. However, it can be really powerful as yep. well and lead to success. And, and I yep. think if you've, if you've got some form of it in place, 
it ensures that you know yourself or, or others within the organization particularly as you grow and not are not taking any shortcuts or, or doing anything wrong it ensures that you know behavior is is aligned with objectives and it's not a you know do anything for do anything for a sale do anything to get you know a project done it, it has to be within um you know certain guardrails as well so i'm um, keen to hear your thoughts on on that as well if, if we think about with the lens of you know small, medium, and, and large organisations who who are who are listening in or, or yeah. employees from large businesses, and it's an important point. You don't does, it doesn't mean you have to have a board, right? A lot of people think of governance. I've got to have a board. It, it's 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 not that important. It's it's what's more important, and I, and I've mentioned discipline a lot through this through this chat. It's about catching up at least once a month, even with your your external accountant or, or your management team, even if you're a small business, the the three four key people below you. And just going through your one page financial dashboard, what are those, what's the one big thing we should nail next quarter? Uh, what's some intel that we're hearing from the market? It doesn't have to be a structured board structure meeting, even, even just a month. It's a discipline of catching up once a month, getting outside the day to day of the business, thinking about strategy and, and how we're going over the next one to two quarters. Just getting that rhythm can have a big impact, even for a small business. Then, obviously, as you get bigger, you might look at an advisory board as a, as a next step. Again, just to get some independent thinking and the rigor that they provide to ensure you've got these things in place that we're talking through. Uh, and then as you get bigger, you might end up with a formal board. But again, it's just all about providing some independence uh, and making sure that the management team are, or the, the senior management team are stepping up out of the business on a regular basis, once a month at least, just to think about the big picture things. And again, the discipline and, and, and the cadence of doing that monthly, you'll start to get a lot more traction and you'll make decisions quicker um, if you start that process. It can be a bit boring, but turn it into a, a fun environment. Don't, don't do it in a boardroom. Go and go and have a half day once a month, you know, under a marquee. We do all of our strategy sessions outdoors, you know, overlooking the broad water or, or make it fun. And then, then it's not a laborious, oh, we've got the, the monthly board meeting again. Make it yeah. fun. Do it somewhere different every environment and, and you'll find that the team really enjoys it. Yeah. Yeah, agreed. I, and that last point there, no major decisions without a, a proper business case is good because that's not necessarily board related. It mm. probably surprises people that it falls into sort of governance and accountability, but it, it, it also gives you that, you know, even if you're a sort of one man band, it gives you, it gives, it forces mm. you to think about, you know, what am I doing? Why am I doing it? What's it going to cost? What's the return? And, and it, it'll help ensure that you're actually making the right decision and, and give you that. Uh, give yeah, you that okay. Yeah, you're right. At the end of the day, it's a lens. A business case is just a lens. And you should, uh, I have three or four questions on your business case. Is is what we're about to do aligned with our why? Does it does it enhance or strengthen our why? Number one thing, is it aligned with our values and our why? Um, an acquisition you're looking at or expanding the business, adding on a new product line. Again, use the hedgehog as a, as a lens. Is this aligned with what we're really great at? Don't stray into, into territory that you're not great at. That's where most businesses come unstuck. Is it, is it along with our why? Is it um, something that we are already good at or, or can be the best at? Um, and does it align with, with, with our, our smacks and our flywheel? Does it strengthen those elements of the business that we talked through earlier? Uh, that's, that's really your business case. And then the numbers will speak for themselves. You might have a business case that financially stacks up, but if it's not aligned with those things, it's not going to work long time, long term. It just won't. So use, use these tools as a lens um, as, you, as you're assessing different business opportunities. Excellent. Well, that was great. We're sort of right on time. A couple, couple of minutes to go. Um, I did I did check to see if there were questions before. Um, there's a couple of um, I'll call it governance and accountability questions. Will these slides be sent out? Yes, they will. Um, the stress factors test. I think that was around the VRI. So, um, mm -hmm. uh, Michael, where can where can people get that? That um, oh, actually no, the stress factors test. That was around picking three three key um, things that would likely happen in a, call it a, um, a, a stress depression test, yeah. or recession, right? Hmm. Just remind we me can, uh, uh, we've got a, what, the, what they were. We've got a one pager we can, we can send out through, through you, Patrick, just on, yeah, on how great. you do it. Um, yeah, that would be good. But effectively you're looking at, yeah, what, what happens if it, if it took, you know, six months to get the, a, a key, key product or input um, material into your business, your, your sales, days, sales outstanding blew out by 20% and your revenue dropped by 30, what would that mean to your, to your P&L and your cash position? So 
um, pretend. And then what, you know, what's attack, the plan of attack? Mm -hmm. Sorry, go on. Yeah, that, and then what's the plan of attack? What, what are the, the 10 to 30 initiatives you would implement uh, to combat that change? Yeah, and just a reminder as well, yes, we are recording. So if people have jumped off or you have to go now, not that you're going to miss much. We uh, we are uh, recording. We'll send that out. Um, so guide to building a resilient business. Um, you can download that um, at creditorwatch.com.au, or you can scan the QR code to get a copy of it. Now, um, the other thing is, for those who would like to be contacted, please let me know. I'll just run. I'll run this now. It's always it's always good that way we can we can get to those people that. Do want to be contacted if you don't want to be contacted don't be shy about clicking no thank you um, it just helps us become more efficient there's probably some sort of ai um, uh, that will be introduced to this in the uh, in the near future no doubt so that we can uh, make it a little bit quicker than than running the poll um, and while while that's happening um, michael i want to say really big thing thank you for today and a lot of work's obviously gone into not only the guide itself, but also uh, prep for the webinar. So, so thank you very much um, for those that that do want to uh, get your get in contact with you. Um, that's coming up on the slide after this. I don't think I can go to it. There we go. Um, there's contact information there. Of course, we're going to send this out. Um, and Michael, any any sort of final final comments or words or uh, other must read books that that, that you'd recommend? Um, so we've kind of covered off the main books, um, but what I would do is of, of the things we talked through today, just choose one or two that resonated with you, um, and and just 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 start with them. Uh, this will be a process of one to two to three years of implementing all these things. They do take time um, to really embed into the business, but just just choose one or two things and start with that. Uh, definitely read Great by Choice, Good to Great. And, and, and Scaling Up by Vern Harnish. Um, fantastic books, you'll get so much, um, so many ideas and thoughts and, and, and uh, initiatives off the back of those that once you start implementing, you'll look back in two, three years and, and you, you might recognize the business. Um, a number of businesses that we've worked with that have, you know, on the Vantage Resilience Index, once you get to those high 30s, early 40s out of 50, the momentum really shifts, it really starts to take off. And again, it's just that momentum, the flywheel, just business becomes easier and easier and easier because all these things are just happening up and down the business. So you don't have to complete them all. Um, just, just just some of these insights that we've talked through today will give your business a huge boost, whether you use your own accountant or, or you do it yourself, just start. Um, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's pretty powerful stuff. Agreed. All right, thank you very much for that, Michael. Great to have you along, and thank you to everyone um, who was, was with us for uh, for the webinar. Keep an eye out for future webinars and and um, obviously downloads, books, etc. from from Credit Watch on the website. You can sign up and subscribe if you're not already a subscriber. And of course, if you've got any questions about um, any of our products, jump on the website and contact us as well. Thank you, everyone. Michael, great to have you along as well. Thanks very much. Yes, I'll uh, see you all soon.